I'm particularly delighted to be able to introduce tonight's meeting because I think it's absolutely in the tradition of the Lytton Phil. We've got cutting edge science meeting controversy. And that's exactly what the Lytton Phil should be looking at. We have Professor Paul Christensen tonight, um, who's a professor at Newcastle University. He's a um, professor of pure and applied electrochemicals, about which I know very little. But I do know South Shields. Paul is a local man, and he went to South Shields High before he embarked on this career. Um, now, as well as the post at Newcastle University, he's an advisor in Bayes for energy storage and safety. He is, most importantly, senior advisor to the National Fire Chief. I'm making no attempt to summarize his research, but if you Google it, you'll see why. It would take the whole two hours. But he tells me that in his spare time, he's an amateur historian who's published on portrait miniatures in the era of Charles I. So he's a Renaissance man, what can I say? His recent work, which has come from destroying lithium ion batteries, is on risk management of the life cycle of lithium ion batteries in electric vehicles. Nothing could be very much more important in Northumberland and the Northeast today. The batteries matter to us. Factories are opening here, particularly in Blythe. Jobs are being created and families are being taken out of poverty. So, to preface Professor Christensen, we've invited Rob Murfin to speak. Rob is the Executive Director of Planning and Local Services for Northumberland, and he was centrally involved in securing the Blythe contract. Rob will outline the decisions that had to be made before and during the contract procurement, and will then be able to look at the risk management in actually securing employment for the people in Blythe and not to speak of electric cars. So for 10 minutes, here is Rob Murfin, who will hand over then to Professor Christensen. Rob. Thank you for that, Mary. Uh, yes, I, I was involved in the decision to grant planning permission for the British Vault factory in Blythe, which, as you may or may not know, will probably generate something like 8,000 jobs uh, and is a really important part of the industrial renaissance of the Northeast. Uh, government's got big aspirations for renewable energy and offshore wind. And so they've been making decisions like a 60 billion pound a contract for difference. Uh, to help stimulate investment in this sector. Uh, and British Volt, which is, a, which is the largest battery plant in, in the UK, will be a stimulus to that. And at full capacity, it will be producing enough lithium-ion lithium -ion batteries for something like 300,000 cars a year. So on that basis, you would say, Where's the difficulty in a decision like that? You know, isn't it good for climate change, taking petrol driven cars off the road? And is it, as, as Mary said, making jobs in an area which has suffered significant in industrial decline and it's part of it's about it reinventing itself? My main thrust is that decisions are never easy though. And uh, I come from a background in, in environmental science and we use some quite simple sort of lenses at looking at these sorts of issues. It's, it's almost as simple on one hand as saying, unless the adverse effects of doing something would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits, then, then you should do it, okay? And clearly by something like 2050, there could well be a billion electric cars on the, on the roads. Uh, internationally and as I said surely that's good for us finally cracking the climate change issue however 
it is not as simple as that. And, and on one hand, the lithium ion batteries uh, are have a very good weight to energy ratio, which means they are you know, really good for electric cars, but they cause major environmental uh, adverse effects through either mining or the processing of lithium. Okay. So taking a step back, how do you make difficult decisions like this? And I tend to look at it through things like life cycle through risk and a concept in environmental legislation called the precautionary principle, uh, the, the precautionary principle. Okay. Risk, right? Nothing is without risk. And I, I don't want to downplay any issues, but there's a concept when you're looking at environmental decision making, where you can look at deaths brought forward. And I can guarantee that anything you want to do of any significance, say building a new school, if you do a proper analysis of the highway impacts from that, you will probably see that there's a concept called deaths brought forward, where over the course of a, a school's active life, it'll probably contribute to, say, 2.2 deaths on the highway. So it can't be a matter of just, just saying no to things because they have you know, an adverse impact. In my job, though, I am discussing all manner of elements of risk. And, you know, take another green technology, wind turbines, you know, very good for climate change. But clearly, there are identified problems there with bird strike, landscape impacts, uh, arguments they can cause epilepsy because of the, of the flutter effect. On things like recycling and composting, you know, composting can cause bio, bio aerosols to be generated if it's carried out in industrial scale you've all you've all heard the arguments about 5g uh, and mobile phone signals and there's been a controversy about the effects of mobile phone masts since the late 1990s there's even issues and let's look at another example to do with the automotive industry when we moved away from leaded petrol to unleaded petrol there was lots of concerns there uh, about increased difficulty in terms of fire risk, putting out fires, lead versus unleaded petrol. To come around to the beginning of my you know, position here is that there are, there are some things which appear to be simple, like that decision to support British Vault. And I remain convinced it's fundamentally a good thing for the Northeast economy. And we are already seeing, as I discussed with government, lots of firms wanting to move into the northeast and to Northumberland become the back of British Vault. So this renaissance will happen. But equally though, I don't think we can ignore risk. And I could give you some, you know, potentially humorous examples of arguments I've heard. Like for example that, you know, building too many wind turbines will lead to a slowing down of the Earth's rotation. But equally there are some very good examples of where we've looked at risk historically, say DDT, smoking, asbestos, where we've had to take action because of them. I heard Paul's presentation uh, some months ago now, and this is a really good example of a full life cycle issue. Okay, It's not about building a battery factory. It's not just about digging the minerals out the problems they cause. It's looking downstream of that. And why Paul's talk's interesting is that a full life cycle analysis would mean that you need to look at what happens to the batteries after they've gone past their prime use, you know, in a car. They will need to be recycled because of you know the materials in them. But just recycling them isn't as simple as you would imagine. And what Paul's going to talk about now is one of the consequences from a life cycle perspective of looking at how batteries from problems from extracting the material right through to recycling the batteries exposes things that you that you would have immediately thought about when you when you are asked the question is a battery plant a good thing or not uh, i'm not trying to say that the world is too complex to make decisions in and i don't want to get into the issues of talking about logical pos positivism here but with that 
I'll, I'll, I'll hand over to Paul, who I think will, will give you a sort of a, a shocking presentation on something that we hadn't thought about in this move to electric vehicles. Okay, thank you. With that, over to Paul. Well, thank you, Rob, for that uh, uh, introduction. Um, perhaps not so much a Renaissance man as a Luddite, given the problems I've had. Anyway, I'll share my screen now and we'll, we'll get going. I'm from Newcastle University. Um, these are some of the things I've been involved with, and I've just re reinforced the idea that everybody should be on mute, otherwise we'll have too much uh, interference. Um, the key point really here from this screen is that what triggered this presentation was my, uh, my team being commissioned by Bayes to look at the safety of second life batteries in domestic battery energy storage systems. And that kind of got me fired up, as you will see. So I'm going to look at the safety implications for the use of second life batteries, which at the moment all come from electric vehicle batteries. And hence the title, I'm going to look at six elephants in the room. Six things that we know, if you like, are bad, but we're still doing it. For example, electric vehicle fast charging, we know that causes lithium metal plating. That reduces the stability of lithium ion batteries, but we're driving to ever faster charging systems. There is a flourishing and unregulated trade in second life batteries, and that really worries me. And then we get on some more technical things covering standards, uh, regulations, and the transport of lithium ion batteries. So what is a lithium ion battery? It's the simplest kind of battery you can come across. It simply consists of two metal foil current collectors. On one is smeared a mixed uh, metal oxide. In this case, I've said lithium cobalt oxide. On the other is smeared literally soot, graphite particles. And these are sandwiched either side of a very thin porous plastic uh, membrane soaked in a mixture of organic solvents, um, lithium hexafluorophosphate, which dissolves to give you the lithium ions, and additives, which are commercial secrets, up to about 5%. Now, most lithium ion batteries that you will come across all use soot as the anode, graphite. So they're known by what the mixed metal oxide is. So lithium cobalt oxide gives you LCO cells. Nickel manganese cobalt oxide gives you NMC cells, and so on and so forth. Now, when a lithium ion cell is fully discharged, all the lithium ions are inside the mixed metal oxide structure. When you charge, they move out, move through the solvent, through the membrane, and into the graphite particles. Now, the, when this happens, when the graphite is lithiated, it's at a much higher energy. So when you discharge, then the lithium ions come back out of the graphite particles and move into the mixed metal oxide. It's so simple, it's called a rocking chair battery. So a quick bit of terminology, the state of charge of the battery is basically the ratio of how much charge is in there to how much charge can be in there, the maximum charge. And it's usually measured in ampere hours. And for the geeks amongst you, one ampere hour is 3,600 coulombs. Now, in my day, back in the 60s, the dim distant past, all batteries were batteries, be it a D cell or a transistor radio battery. Nowadays, it's slightly more complicated. The smallest unit of a lithium ion battery is the cell. And these come in three principal form factors, shapes and sizes. Cylindrical cells are a little bit bigger than a AA battery. Pouch cells are typically the size of an A4 sheet and about a centimeter thick. And prismatic batteries are about the size of two cigarette packets joined lengthways. Many cells make a string or more commonly a module. Many strings or modules make a battery. And all form factors are employed in electric vehicles. So some typical electric vehicle designs, this is a Tesla which consists of cylindrical cells up to 8,000. This is the Jaguar I-Pace. Also, this, con uh, this consists of pouch cell. This is the BMW i3, which is prismatic cells. And this is my favorite for obvious reasons, because I'm from South Shields. This is the Nissan Leaf, which also consists of pouch cells. 
common theme is actually that the battery pack is always located in the floor and forms part of the chassis of the uh, electric vehicle. So what makes them special? They store a huge amount of energy in a very small space. And they're perfect for storing renewable energy, which is intermittent. And given the fact that everybody has access to wind um, and solar energy, maybe not so much the solar energy up north here, and quite a few people have access to wave energy, then maybe if we stop relying on oil, we'll stop trying to kill each other over it, some hope. No previous battery has ever come close to the energy density of lithium-ion batteries. What makes them not so great? The huge amount of energy stored in a very small space. If that energy gets out in an uncontrolled fashion, then you get toxic gas that can also ignite to be to give long flare-like flames or can even explode. And my personal belief here is that the penetration of lithium-ion batteries into our society has far outstripped our knowledge of the risks and hazards. But don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of lithium-ion batteries and I wholeheartedly and absolutely supported British Volt coming to the Northeast. And I am actively involved in helping the Nissan stroke Envision Gigafactory plans with respect to their fire, uh, et cetera, safety, liaising between them and the fire service. Now, the, the first battery not to use water as an electrolyte, if they did, the water would be instantly electrolyzed to hydrogen and oxygen. They also use plastic components and they use organic solvents instead of water. If they are abused by overheating, crushing, penetration, or overcharging, the cells move into what's called thermal runaway. More about that in a second. That then causes them to emit gases that can ignite into a flame. Delayed ignition can result in a vapor cloud explosion. And there have also been spontaneous failures, failures occurring, particularly of electric vehicle batteries. The gases are toxic, flammable, and potentially explosive, as I've said. And these large battery energy storage systems, which includes electric vehicles, but also grid scale battery energy storage systems, can burn for much longer. They require large volumes of water and they can reignite many times, hours, days, or even weeks later. And of course, with electric vehicle batteries and the bigger batteries, you've got the problems of the stranded electrical energy, which can give you electric shock, electrocution, or even arc flash explosion. So what is thermal runaway? When a cell is abused, then chemical processes take over from the electrochemical processes. The electrochemical processes are simply the movement of electrons in the external circuit and the movement of lithium ions inside the cell. Now, once these are superseded, the chemical reactions produce heat and gases. Heat speeds up chemical reactions, and it does so exponentially, as you can see from the red line. Now, as they speed up, they generate more heat and more gases, and you've got uncontrolled positive feedback. In other words, thermal runaway. Now, we still don't know everything about lithium-ion batteries by a long chalk. Not only are we fighting about the precise chemical processes that um, cause thermal runaway or trigger thermal runaway, we are still disagreeing about the definition of thermal runaway. One definition is essentially when we see a particular rate of temperature rise, one degree centigrade per minute, one degree centigrade per second. And that occurs when the rate at which heat is dissipated, which is linear, the blue line, crosses the, li the, the red line, the heat uh, that's produced. In other words, heat is produced faster than it can be dissipated, so we see a measurable temperature rise. But a far better definition of thermal runaway is when those exothermic heat-producing chemical processes become self-sustaining. Now, thermal runaway should be pre prevented by all the safety systems that are present in lithium-ion batteries. The first safety system is a serendipitous one. It's the solid electrolyte interface. Lithium-ion batteries are thermodynamically unstable. In other words, they should not exist. As soon as the solvent hits the fully charged graphite electrode, in other words, the lithiated graphite, it generates hydrogen and other gases and heat. And it should just go into, uh, into continued thermal runaway. 
but a protective layer forms on the graphite during that first charge that stops the solvent touching the lithiated graphite, but still allows lithium ions through. We then have the battery management system, the BMS, and we then have a whole series of chemical and physical safety systems, which I'm not going to go into. And this is a key problem, actually. A lithium ion battery is not simply a battery. It's an electronic device, electrical device. Unlike a lithium, uh, a lead acid battery, which is simply a battery. Every battery in your mobile phones, in your laptops, in electric vehicles, have battery management systems. They have to. And that differentiates them from lithium ion batteries. And unfortunately, I don't think this concept has got through. Now, prior to ignition, the gases will, that are produced will eventually vent. In prismatic and cylindrical cells, because they are in metal cans, they vent through blast caps, safety valves. With pouch cells, the pouch cells simply burst. And what's emitted is hydrogen up to 50%, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and a series of very toxic gases, hydrogen fluoride, hydrogen chloride, and hydrogen cyanide. Gases such as ethane, methane, and other hydrocarbons, and also small droplets of the organic solvent. And this gives it a thick white appearance, which has been mistaken for smoke and also for steam. But it is, in fact, a vapor cloud. So the sequence of events are as shown here. Thermal runaway produces heat and gases. The gases vent. Now, commonly what happens is that the small particles of the cathode, the, the heavy metal oxides, are vented first as a, a black cloud that looks like black smoke. And then you get the vapor cloud. If that ignites immediately, in many ways, that's good news. The vapor cloud is, is replaced by a very thin fume and long flare-like flames. Fire is easy to deal with. If, however, it doesn't ignite immediately and you get delayed ignition, which has happened, then you can get a vapor cloud explosion. A vapor cloud explosion can give rise to overpressures of the order of six, seven, or eight atmospheres. And a tenth of an atmosphere is sufficient to kill you. Now, as I've said, the thermal runaway should be prevented by safety systems. But most of these are designed to stop the electrochemical processes. And so by the time they are deployed, it's simply too late. And fires and explosions have happened on land, in the air, on the sea, and indeed under the sea. Now, to give you an idea of the effects of the smoke from a burning lithium ion battery, this is a video from Parsons Green tube station in London. And it was a small scooter battery that caught fire. You can see it at the end of the platform. That's the guy that got a lung full of the smoke. And if you look at the amount of smoke from that small battery, and I'm afraid a fire extinguisher wouldn't work against the lithium ion battery. So that kind of gives you the idea of the effect of the fume. Now we did a number of experiments, partly to help the fire and rescue services deal with electric vehicle and big grid scale battery fires, but also partly to try and understand more about thermal runaway. So we were really, our first set of uh, first work was, we basically didn't know what was gonna happen. And that was last year in 2020 in January. And then again in March at the Fire Services College and at the RAF Spade Adam. But those experiments led us to the vapor cloud. And we decided to try and actually ignite a vapor cloud explosion in spring of this year at uh, RAF Spade Adam. So what we're going to look at first is the immediate ignition. And I have to thank Envision EESC, which used to be the old Nissan battery plant, for supplying us with the modules we used and with their wholehearted support for all the work we've done with first responders and fire and rescue services, etc. So these modules are from are what are used in a Nissan LEAF. There are 24 of these modules in a 2018 and afterward, afterwards Nissan LEAF. And the first video we're gonna see is a fully charged module, 1.7 kilowatt hours. So in other words, 100% SOC. That hammer with the nail 
is 23 kilograms. So what you saw there was, first of all, the emission of the heavy metal particles, which can be a bit of an environmental risk. Um, and then the vapor cloud, which immediately ignited. And you saw, I mean, these are pouch cells, which are just like very large crisp packets. And you saw how much energy threw that hammer in the air and then those 12 foot long flames. Now, a typical domestic battery energy storage system in the house supporting, say, a photovoltaic array, the commercial ones run from two to 130 kilowatt hours, and they tend to be more towards like 50 kilowatt hours ish. Now, remember that the energy capacity of those modules was 1.67 kilowatt hours. There are no regulations governing domestic battery energy storage systems. And this is where the second life bit comes in. People are building their own battery energy storage systems out of second-hand lithium-ion batteries. Now, the next experiment I'm going to show you, we were mimicking an, uh, a domestic battery energy storage system, and we set up eight modules, each with eight cells in. Okay, so this would come out at around 13, 14 kilowatt hours, so it would be a bit of a small domestic battery energy storage system. Note the crackling sound. If you, if you can hear the sound, note the crackling sound, but don't worry if you can't. I should say all we're doing is overcharging two out of the eight cells in this end module. And by the time that this video finishes, not all of that first module is gone and none of the other seven. So it's only from a few more uh, cells in this first module what you're gonna see. And the video is not speeded up. And notice the crackling noise. That's only two cells gone by now. I don't want to hang around too long. So I don't want to move on to the next one. So we wondered what the crackling noise was. And luckily, we had a drone circling. And if you watch, you'll see just you see bits there. What was actually happening was that the concrete was spalling due to the explosive vaporization of the water inside the concrete. And it was projecting lumps of concrete up to 30 meters horizontally and about 10 meters in the air. One piece nearly took out the drone. Now in Germany, they have banned electric vehicles for, or in two states, they've banned electric vehicles from their parking houses because they accept that they can't put electric vehicle fires out and they're worried about the structural integrity of the buildings. Now, if the vapor cloud does ignite, what happens? Now, this was an experiment where we were trying to detonate um, a vapor cloud explosion. So there's various squibs gonna go up. But as it turns out, we were below the lower explosion limit, which is about six to 11%, as it turns out, for the gases from lithium ion batteries. Now, we had discovered that if we only partly charged these modules up to 40%, ignition was either delayed or didn't take place at all. Now, it doesn't matter how, the, how batteries are abused, the kind of things you're seeing, the kind of responses have occurred with nail penetration, overcharge, heating, it doesn't matter, okay? So the first thing will be the ejection of the heavy metal particles, the black, what looks like smoke. Then we get the white vapor cloud. Remember, up to 50% hydrogen, hydrogen cyanide, hydrogen fluoride. We detected these gases. Um, small droplets of the solvent. Um, behind us is a clear plastic blast wall, so the light is going to drop in a second. What we realized from our experiments was that you always get two types of vapor cloud, a heavier than air and a buoyant one, which dominates seems to depend upon the chemistry of the cathode, but on other factors that we're not too sure about yet. 
So at the moment, it's generating the buoyant cloud. And in a second, the heavier than air cloud will start. But imagine this in the domestic environment. Typically, these battery energy storage systems are found in the loft or under the stairs next to the main switchboard. And when I show this to fire and rescue officers, they tend to go a tad pale. There's the heavier than air cloud creeping out. And remember that's explosive and toxic. It is a bit eerie that. Okay, so a few instances, this shows you a crash. You can find this if you just look at the sun, the, the newspaper, the video, as you can see there. The car hit another car and then crashed into the pillar of this bridge. So if you watch the bottom right or the middle right, Remember, there's no diesel or petrol in that vehicle. This is a very important video because it actually shows a deflagration. A deflagration is a subsonic explosion. An explosion is a, uh, is a great, it's faster than speed of sound explosion. In other words, the shock wave moves faster than the speed of sound for an explosion and slower than the speed of sound for a deflagration. And the vapor cloud uh, is typically a deflagration. So they wrongly attribute this to smoke. These are electric buses in China. It's speeded up, it's a bit of a time lapse. But the important point comes up next. They're open-sided buses notice, so it's not particularly constrained. It's not smoke, it's the white vapor cloud. And it deflagrates, it actually deflagrates. This shows, again, this idea of the heavier there and lighter than air. These, this is an e-moped in a covered garage. And you can see the heavier than air and the lighter than air vapor clouds. And then it actually deflagrates as well. You bear in mind that in order to ignite a hydrogen explosion, you just need enough energy that will be given out by a five penny piece being dropped onto the floor from waist height. And you can see the deflagration there. There's been a number of grid scale battery energy storage instances, um, about 40 in the last uh, 10 years, but in fact, mostly in the last three years, there's been about 38. The most recent occurred yesterday, but I haven't been able to check up on that because I've been practicing for this. At least four of these were vapor cloud explosions, we know for sure, and in fact, probably most of them were VCEs. Sadly, the one in Beijing killed two firefighters. The explosion in Arizona, in surprise, killed, it didn't kill anybody, but only just, and it badly injured four, two of them very severely indeed. There have been explosions on board ships um, and submarines and fires, etc., and indeed on hybrid aircraft. Fires in UK scrapyards are costing this country about £160 million pounds per annum, but unlike America, there haven't been any fatalities or injuries yet. So, OK, I've covered instances involving new and end-of-life LIBs. What about second-life ones, which is what we're on about in this lecture? So, first of all, we need to look at what's called the, big, the, the uh, state of health of the battery. When a battery is new, its state of health is 100%. In other words, all of the, of the charge that it could have is available. But as it goes through its first life in an electric vehicle, some of the lithium becomes removed, inactive. Now, if it's, if it's inactive due to the fact it's stored as lithium ions, that's fine. If it becomes inactive because it's formed lithium metal on the graphite particles, that's bad news. Now, it's generally accepted that when a lithium ion battery reaches 80% state of health, in other words, it's got 80% maximum charge compared to when it started its life, then it's no longer any good for electric vehicles. Now, that's actually based on nickel metal hydride electric vehicles way back when, but somehow seems to be transferred to lithium ion batteries. But nevertheless, that's now accepted. But a lithium ion battery with 80% of its charge still there is a very valuable commodity and can be reused. Moreover, 
Second life has many, many potential advantages. Not least is that, as uh, Rob said, digging the lithium, et cetera, out of the ground can have major effects, detrimental environmental effects, both in terms of the resources needed, the amount of pollution it might generate, and the electricity it needs. And of course, because of the demand for lithium, the prices of lithium have shot up. Moreover, reuse, remanufacture, or repurposing, more about that in a second, can actually extend battery life by seven to 10 years, reduce CO2 emissions, and it could lower the cost of the electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So the drivers and the, the rationale for second life using batteries again is absolute, and I do not disagree with it. So what do we mean by reuse, remanufacture, repurpose, recycle? Well, if we take recycle first, all that means is that the battery is taken apart and the components are crushed to get back the cobalt, the nickel, the lithium, the manganese. Now, at the moment, a lithium ion battery recycling industry, in, in fact, in the whole of the West, is still very nascent. It's far more developed in China and Korea, but it's very nascent here. Now, if we have a battery um, that we take out of an electric vehicle and then we reuse it in a second electric vehicle, for example, maybe the first electric vehicle, the, 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 the chassis has been damaged, but the battery is undamaged, that's called reuse. We're reusing it in the same application, electric vehicle. If we take a battery and we replace damaged or dead modules by modules that have got roughly the same state of health, and then we reuse that in an electric vehicle, still the same application, that's remanufacture. The third option is that if we take an electric vehicle pack, we check the modules, we recycle the ones that maybe have reached their end of life or are damaged, and then we reuse the other modules in a, in a new battery pack for a different application. For example, as a battery energy storage system, grid scale or in a house, that's called repurposing. Now, the, the market for Second Life electric vehicle LIBs is perceived to be huge. And don't forget, there's going to be an awful lot of these electric vehicle packs coming down the pike at some point from all the electric vehicles that are already on the road. And remember, lithium ion battery, battery electric vehicles appeared first in 2008. So they've, they've got perceived use in small industrial or commercial systems, in grid scale battery energy storage systems, and that's perceived to be the main market, in residential storage, and particularly in um, commercial and DIY systems, and it's the do-it-yourself, second-life domestic battery energy storage systems that really concern me, and as do niche applications, people, the public getting involved with these big battery systems. So what about the aging and the abuse of batteries? If you cycle batteries, in other words, charge and discharge, within their set limits, there's no problem at all. Electrolyte is consumed because we get loss of the lithium um, during the lifetime, and that can lead to dry spots, local dry areas. But overall, it's perceived that if you, if you do what you're supposed to do, there shouldn't be a problem. But at some point, the aging of the battery will accelerate, either due to new aging mechanisms or simply due to the acceleration of the existing ones. And once the battery passes about 50% to 60% state of health, in other words, has about 50 to 60% of the original capacity left, then it is perceived that the battery will become unstable and unusable and potentially dangerous. The ideal situation is that the knee occurs after second life, but there is the possibility of the knee occurring during second life. Now we know that charging lithium ion batteries at high currents or at low temperatures, less than five degrees centigrade, causes lithium metal to plate on the graphite particles. 
This is bad news. Essentially, the lithium metal itself can, de cause, can destabilize the battery and make it more prone to thermal runaway. As more and more lithium metal plates, it changes its structure from island-like to dendrites, very fine fil fil filaments, which can penetrate the separator and touch the other electrode. And that can result in a catastrophic short circuit, thermal runaway fire and explosion. We know that fast charging electric vehicles increases the problem of both aging and lithium metal plating. It can also cause the graphite to detach, all of which can lead to dual heating and thermal runaway. We know this, but there is an ever increasing dash to ever faster charging. Hence the elephant in the room. Now we know that risk is, and I'm probably going to get the evil eye from one of my friends who's watching, who is a, um, a statistician, but risk is sample size times probability times severity. Now the risk, the hazards of, with respect to second light batteries are the same as for first light, but the probability of failure is, pro is higher because of all these uh, events that can be taking place. So how do we assess the safety of a second light battery? It was thought that state of health could do this, but it's way too inadequate a description. We actually need a definition of state of safety. Now, the nearest I've come across to actually addressing state of safety is the United States Underwriters Laboratory's 1974 standard, which I regard as good practice. First of all, it uses the battery management system, the information, if it's available, to look at the past life of that battery in the first life, to look at the number of times it's been abused. And if they don't like what they see, the battery is sent straight off for recycling, materials recovery. So if any of these parameters are out of specification, it goes for recycling. If it gets beyond this, then, the pack, the incoming pack, is tested. It's open circuit voltage, it's internal resistance, which can give an idea of heating effects, et cetera. Um, it's self-discharge characteristics. And again, if necessary, the pack is rejected and sent for recycling. If not, then it's disassembled. And there's visual inspection, et cetera, all throughout this process. The modules are then tested in the same way as the pack was tested, and they are graded. So modules that have the same kind of state of health based on all these parameters are graded the same, okay? Because cell balancing is very, very important in these big packs. So this UL 1974 standard recognizes that state of safety is not just the state of health. And there are companies in the UK and Europe that are using good practice. They are testing, they're visually inspecting. They are accepting that state of safety is important. And in many cases, the original electric vehicle or battery manufacturer is involved in this um, system. And that's great because in principle, you've got the battery management system data. However, in the case, for example, where batteries are warranty replacements. They're basically being replaced on warranty on at least two occasions, two different um, companies. I found out that in fact, the vehicle identification number becomes disconnected from the serial numbers of the modules in the packs. So the battery management system data is not then available. So glitches can occur, but in general, where the companies are involved in the value chain, then they tend to make, to, to, to repurpose batteries for battery energy storage systems that are for industrial use. And everybody accepts that this is not something to worry about. And indeed some companies have gone even further and are getting involved in a whole life approach to lithium batteries. For example, VW Group. Tesla is taking, a, a, if you like, the safer option. It does not support the repurposing of its batteries. It says they should go for materials recovery or recycling. In contrast, 
companies in my experience that are selling online don't carry out tests to, in any way to test the safety of, of their packs, modules, or cells that they're selling. So this is from a couple of days ago. This is a Tesla pack that's on sale online. As you can see, it's stored outside with the partially covered by a tarpaulin and it's damaged. Now, this is something like a 600 volt battery. Okay, and the public can pick it up and you'll see why they're telling the public to pick up in a second. But these batteries cannot be shut down. They cannot be shut off. You can't turn a battery off. So you've got the, all the possibilities of electrocution, et cetera. You've also got all the dangers or the hazards I've laid out before. Hence the elephant in the room. This is another pack from a damaged Tesla again. And again, you can pick this up in person. And again, these are various packs. Now, again, these can't be switched off. You've got high voltage devices for which in general, the public don't have the experience to deal with. And it's the public that I'm, I'm worried about here. And you've got the possibility of all the of vapor cloud explosions, fire, toxic gas, but also in all of these cases, or there is no information available of that first life. We do not know whether these packs have been abused and the public have got no way of knowing. Indeed, they probably don't realize they should find out what kind of life that pack had during its life as an electric vehicle pack. Hence the next elephant in the room. Now, as is many, the case quite often, the Australians are ahead of the game again. And they've basically said, they've brought in a new law that says the public can't really get their hands on used electric vehicle packs. You have to have a license, basically. And I think a regulated trade is essential. I'm not against a trade in second life batteries. I'm against a second life, sorry, a, an unregulated trade in second life batteries. This is a particular niche market where they're using um, batteries from crashed electric vehicles to upgrade classic cars into electric. Now, bear in mind that the first fire involving electric vehicle, a modern electric vehicle, was when a Chevy Volt, the forerunner to the Bolt, was T-bone tested in a standard test. It passed the test, and then three weeks later, it ignited. Okay, what about the right to repair? Well, yes. I believe in a right to repair, but I believe you have to be trained. You have to know what you're doing. And at the moment, the right to repair, if we take it to its extreme, means that homeowners should be allowed to build their own gas boilers with secondhand parts sourced from the internet, if we make an analogy with lithium ion batteries. We're on a steep learning curve, and we're at the very beginning of that learning curve. And I don't think it's appropriate that everybody should have access to these very high energy devices. Now, in contrast to UL 1974, all UK, European and international standards rely on type tests. Essentially, you take a batch, say 100 batteries, you test 10 to destruction, and if they pass the test, then you say the other 90 are safe and can be sold, bought, used. Now that's fine for new cells because the quality control of new cells is absolutely brilliant, okay? But during their life in an electric vehicle, the batteries get absolutely hammered. And you cannot then say that one cell is exactly the, has had exactly the same experience as another cell and has exactly the same state of safety. That's highlighted by some work from my good friends and colleagues here in Newcastle, who took a Nissan Leaf 2011 battery pack, disassembled it, and measured the state of health, okay? And you can see that red has a much lower state of health than deep blue. And you can see that it doesn't matter where in the pack they are, it seems to be almost completely random how the state of health varies, but it varies by up to 14%. And that is 
holy and unacceptable if you're going to use a type test, as it's called, to assess the safety of these modules. Type tests will only prove that the modules or cells tested are safe or unsafe. It's not representative, elephant in the room. The BSI actually has identified the fact that tests for second life batteries is a major gap. Now, the draft standards IEC 6330 and 6338, which will be adopted by uh, Britain and other countries, they are supposed to cover second life batteries. Now, the invalidity of type tests is made explicit in IEC 6338, this draft code. And none of these tests, nor the new draft EU batteries regulation, actually require testing of second life batteries to prove their safety. They all rely on the battery management system. Now, there are problems here because the battery management system, the information contained therein is intellectual property. And it is not at all clear at this time that the electric vehicle manufacturers will want to release this intellectual property to a, a third party, the repurposer, elephant in the room. Now, my particular bugbear are DIY Second Life domestic battery energy storage systems. These are banned completely in America. And in fact, domestic systems, whether new or using Second Life batteries, are not allowed in the domestic living environment in the United States, Australia, or New Zealand. And again, our friends down under are ahead of the game. There are no regulations whatsoever concerning this in the UK. This is a system I was called out to by one of my friends in the fire and rescue services. The homeowner entirely innocently had bought modules online from America, from a company I, call, I choose to call John Wayne and Son Cowboys. No history associated with these. And remember, if you cycle batteries, these lithium ion batteries at temperatures less than five degrees C, or indeed at high temperatures, or if you rapid charge them, you can get lithium metal plating, which destabilizes them. And this was in the third floor, in the airing cupboard, in the bedroom, next to the hot water tank. And bear in mind again that these batteries start to go unstable at around 70 degrees centigrade. My question to the local fire and rescue service was, OK, we found one. Where are the rest? And actually, what I tend to tell fire and rescue services is that if you see a solar array on a roof or a wind turbine, assume that there's a battery energy storage system, lithium ion battery energy storage system, in the building until you're told otherwise. And I know that councils are installing domestic battery energy storage systems in council houses because they don't know. You know, as I said, we're at the bottom of a very steep learning curve. And I know of other councils who are installing grid scale battery energy storage systems on school premises. The transport of second life lithium ion batteries, this has driven me mad. I have spent nearly 12 months trying to get to the bottom of this and only got the final answer about four hours ago. Um, so lithium and batteries are classified as dangerous goods under UN 38 and their transport must conform to the type tests specified in UN 38.3. Now there are eight of these tests and they're essentially tests of destruction. But the trouble is that UN 38.3 was formulated long before the concept of second life. People still think of lithium ion batteries like lead acid batteries. A lead acid battery has a first life and then it's recycled. And that's what was assumed when UN 38.3 was written. So UN 38.3 and everything that comes from it does not apply to second life batteries. It only applies to batteries being placed on the market the first time. And that means the type tests, which we know, and as you can see, BAM agrees, type tests are not valid for second life batteries. And indeed, it doesn't matter because UN 38.3 doesn't apply. Regulation five of the UK carriage of dangerous goods, et cetera, regs, is derived from 38.3 but it doesn't apply to people. 
if you will pick up a battery, a second life battery, even if it's damaged from an online supplier, no problem. If, however, the supplier sends it by a courier, then the carriage and dangerous goods regs kick in. If the battery is less than 330 kilograms, then there are certain relaxations of what's called the ADR regulations, which um, are, as you can see, a cold relative, et cetera. If it's greater than 330 kilograms, but only if it's going by a company, then the full ADR regulations apply. You have to have a driver who is fully trained, five to 10 day course and has passed the exam, correct markings, the correct transportation documents, and appropriate and approved, i.e. tested packaging. Packaging groups are three, two, and one. Number two, if it's undamaged or damaged, or damaged and defective, and, uh, defective, then you can use a wooden coffin or box, okay? As well as all the other things that we just said on the previous slide. If it's damaged, defective, and I love this term, uh, industry doesn't like explosion or deflagration. It likes rapid disassembly. If the battery is likely to rapidly disassemble, then you have to go to very great lengths um, to contain it in a sealed metal box. And you have to have permission from the Department for Transport to move it. Unless, of course, you're a member of the public. Then it's all right. The difference is a flavor in the, our appreciation of law. German law, an activity must be specifically allowed to be legal. Under English law, unless it's explicitly banned, it's allowed so long as it's safe. And an awful lot is hinging upon that word safe, upon the precise definition. So conclusions, there is a, a, an increased probability of failure with second life batteries. The transport and sale of second life batteries is completely uncontrolled, unregulated, and this should be stopped. I do not want to stop the trade. I want to stop the unregulated trade. Domestic battery energy storage systems involving lithium ion batteries should also be regulated and do it yourself ones should be banned entirely. I believe unstable batteries are being transported and purchased. And I believe that the state of safety of second life batteries should be assessed using the BMS and testing. And I think that the standards are hopelessly confused in this respect. And I have a certain degree of sympathy because it's generally accepted there are no, or there is no generally accepted test for the safety of second life lithium ion batteries. And I think if I could, I would shout this from the rooftops. There should be a nationwide campaign to educate all stakeholders, stakeholders, including perhaps and especially the public and the government, in fact, about lithium ion batteries. And this is simply an excuse to show an elephant. I like elephants. And I thank you all for your kind attention and for putting up with all my mistakes at the beginning. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Uh, sorry. Well, thank you, Rob, also, but thank you very much, Paul. Um, all I can say is that it's sobering. And I'm sure that's the case for... Sorry, you can't see me. Mm -hmm. Now you can. Um, you heard me, though. I, yeah. it, it is sobering. It was very thorough. It was very clear and very sobering. And um, I think we're throwing open for questions, really, rather than me giving a an uninformed commentary on what you've just on what you've just said. So, if you have a question, will you please put it in the chat? And Kay Eason is going to field your questions. Um, there are lots of you. I can't see exactly how many, 130 of you signed up. I think <coughs> we have about 70. So take it slowly. And what Kay will do is if questions 
are repetitive as they're bound to be. Some, 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 you, some of you repeat yourselves because you can't hear or see. She will simply ask once. Okay, Kay, are you there? I'm there, yes, I'm here. Is, do we have anything I, coming through? Is there life out there? It's weird anything. doing this one, absolutely weird. <laughs> or has... I haven't seen anything Paul yet. silenced everyone. I think we've got one come up here. Yes, someone's just thanking you, Paul, for the lecture. Excellent, thank you. I'm so glad it's been recorded. Good. Okay, I've got other oh, better alternatives in the pipeline. There is considerable research on, on new and completely different types of, of batteries, including lithium ion batteries, but they seem to be quite far down the pipeline. But the, I think my view from what I know is that these batteries are always trying to cram ever more energy into an ever smaller space. And that, I'm afraid, always comes with risks. And it's always down to the uncontrolled release of the energy. Now, you know, we have all solid state batteries quite far down the line, which are perceived to be safer because they don't have any electrolyte, any organic solvents. But our own experiments and experiments of others have shown that one of the things that can throw a lithium ion battery into thermal runaway is that when all the solvent is ejected, and the, the separator collapses, the two electrodes touch each other. And then a highly exothermic solid state reaction takes place with direct transfer of electrons between the two electrodes that catapults the cell from 250 degrees centigrade to 800 degrees centigrade in seconds. So there will always be risks associated with high energy devices. Yeah. Uh, Mary, could I bookend my introduction? I don't see why not, for all, as long as you don't take too long. No, I'll be quick while people have a chance to type in their questions. And uh, again, I think uh, Paul's presentation uh, reinforced lots of the messages about how we approach risk in society. And there's some real choice detail points in there, which I draw people's attention to. Paul talked about fast charging being a problem that, in this entire scenario. But equally, there's a counter pull that fast charging and the availability of fast charging is seen as a key way of achieving market penetration and public acceptance mm. of electric cars because of perception of the problem with uh, charging. Uh, I would say... From what Paul said, in that uh, this is also a question about our approach to what is called red tape, okay? Uh, and I spent an entire career pushing back against government about saying too much red tape, be it on water pollution, air pollution, or whatever. Uh, the issue is, though, it was really telling what Paul, what Paul said as well about Germany. And this is almost like the inverse of the precautionary principle. And it's a fascinating concept for us, for us in the UK who are, and we almost look at ourselves, we are regulation adverse. And that difference between the Germans saying something is not lawful unless it's regulated, whereas we, whereas we say it's lawful unless there's a need to regulate it. And lots of the arguments <coughs> about environmental legislation, be that smoking, DDT, asbestos, many people say, well, all those issues regarded as were being was regarded as being safe until proved otherwise. So I think there's some big questions here. Finally, my point, I listen to what Paul says, is that regulation about the domestic usage should be the same from my perspective as regulation of storing your LPG in your own house if you want to. We don't do that. And I think the answer probably is to use slow charge, extensive rather than intensive use batteries say for trickle feeding from winter uh, from wind farms rather than encouraging people to use them at home but i'd be interested in what paul says about you know large scale usage rather than intensive in building usage thanks okay well, i see that there's um is there lithium in the vapor cloud 
Um, I don't think it's been measured. I would, I would be surprised if it wasn't, um, given that you get the ejection of small droplets of, of the actual solvent, which may well contain uh, the electrolyte. With respect to burning temperatures, yes, we've measured, we've measured temperatures on the module and others have measured the temperature of the flames, and you're talking a thousand degrees centigrade or more. Um, Paul, someone is asking which MPs or government departments are listening to these concerns? Uh, well, up until uh, a few, well, up until probably mid last year, the only MP that had taken any um, interest was the wonderful Chion Wura, the MP for Central Newcastle. And I, I know that she is still interested in keeping an eye on things. And she's asked several questions in the House. Um, Sadly, the government, uh, or rather the Conservative Party, don't seem to be taking any notice, but certain government departments are certainly interested. Uh, the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy are certainly interested. And I'm starting to talk to more and more government departments, <clears throat> as well as um, um, other organisations from insurance companies to uh, the defence, you know, Department, Ministry of Defence, etc. Because as I've made, you know, made plain, lithium-ion batteries are in all levels of our society. They are everywhere, and you've got ships that have got huge battery energy storage systems uh, that don't have the right kind of firefighting capability. Um, you name it, there's a lithium battery somewhere. And yes, I think there should be education in schools. And, and I've started reaching out to schools to offer to give uh, presentations. The first one being my old alma mater in South Shields. Really? <laughs> and I think there was a question about the chemical industry. Um, can we learn from the chemical industry? I think we can learn from the chemical industry. Um, and one of my excellent team uh, at Newcastle um, was a safety officer um, and we learned an awful lot from him. It's not rocket science to be able to do it. We will get there. Don't get me wrong. We know how to manage risk. Okay. Once we understand risk, we are brilliant at managing it. Nuclear industry, the chemical industry, um, the, I mean, the, the battery manufacturing plant, uh, the old Nissan one that's now envisioned, no problems at all. Uh, absolutely professional um, guys. The safety officer who is actually watching this, uh, hi Dave, is absolutely brilliant. You know, we can manage risk. We just have to understand what the hazards are. And as I said, we're at the bottom of a very steep learning curve at the moment. Um, somebody would like to know more about the concrete spalling, especially in the context of EVs in car parking facilities? Well, you've hit upon a major concern. Uh, there's very little research on um, lithium-ion battery electric vehicle fires or indeed battery energy storage system fires in enclosed environments such as tunnels or subterranean uh, car parks, sub-levels. They are, I mean, Electric vehicles chargers are being installed inside, uh, inside such structures. Indeed, battery energy storage systems are being installed in the sub basements of flats. But this has got fire and rescue services extremely worried. It's challenging to start with, but I mean, just for access. But you imagine if you have a large battery of whatever sort in thermal runaway, but not on fire, and the explosions in. Um, some of those grid scale battery energy storage systems, there was no fire at all. The cells went into the thermal runaway, generated the thick white vapor, and then at some point that deflagrated. Imagine a firefighter faced with a thick white cloud. You can't see through it. It's contaminating your, your PPE, your personal protective equipment. It's toxic and it's potentially explosive and you're underground. We need to understand the challenges. Firefighters, the UK Fire and Rescue Service, indeed most, if not all, fire and rescue services are brilliant. They know what they're doing. They can handle fire. They can handle toxic gas. They can handle explosion. 
But putting these three together, or any two, that represents a wholly new challenge. And they, just like everybody else, are on a very rapid learning curve. Um, somebody is asking, are cases being counted by the Office of National Statistics? Not that I'm aware of. The only um, uh, group that is actually monitoring uh, lithium-ion battery failures, electric vehicles, grid scale, is, um, IF, uh, is um, a, co a group in New South Wales, in Australia, linked to the Fire and Rescue Service there. And I have to give a call out to the New South Wales firefighters because that, that service is really on the ball and ahead of the game. So there you go. I would add, Paul, just a quick throw in from me, that in terms of us running away with our enthusiasm for tackling climate change, which I'm not saying, uh, in, in 12 months' time, changes to the building regulations will require every new house to come with EV charging points. It doesn't say where they need to be, whether they're in inside integral garages, outside or not. It's not been done the same way as the introduction of LPG regulations. I do know that um, they are actually modifying that because I've seen the documents to where it's to do with flats, etc. Um, and it's an enclosed space, you have to put in the infrastructure, the wires, but you don't install the actual charger because they are waking up to the possibility um, or to, to the potential problems. In terms of um, linking charging to fires, it's all we, all we have is hearsay at the moment because people aren't collecting the statistics. Um, and... Uh, about the, the concrete spalling, the problem is that with electric vehicle fires, you tend to get high di highly directional flames. So the heat release rates for an electric vehicle are comparable to that of an ordinary diesel or petrol vehicle. But the key difference is it's highly directional. What you've got is essentially a rocket-like flame pointing at a single spot. Okay. And there is a, 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 a theory that the collapse of the airport uh, of the airport car park in Stavanger, which was very rapid, was partly caused by the fact that electric vehicles form quite a large fraction of the cars in Norway. So, uh, and again, as I said, at least two German states are worried about this particular uh, unique factor of electric vehicles. And um, um, yeah, somebody... cold winter, yeah, co installing charging points um, outside. Well, it's uh, the, the battery should be fairly protected inside a car. What's more worrying is if you install all your domestic battery energy storage systems outside and they're not protected from cold weather or indeed extremes away. I don't think we need to worry about the Arizona temperatures up here in Northumberland. Uh, like plus 40 degrees centigrade, but certainly I could easily see there being low temperature problems across the UK. And yeah, as I said, we're on a, on a steep learning curve. We'll get yeah. there, but we're on a steep learning curve. Yeah, and I would add, Paul, to that, is that we have to look at things which will manifest, manifest themselves in the marketplace. And that if you're talking about well, that figure I quoted in my introduction, <laughs> that... By 2050, there'll be a billion electric cars on the road. You have to take then a step back and saying, what will that mean for supply chains and the recycled markets? If we, you know, which will be on a graph of increased availability of the issues you're talking about, and the and the fact that some batteries are for sale on eBay at the moment will only become much more significant and more prevalent mm -hmm. unless something, you know, unless steps are taken to. Raise a word. I, I, I wholeheartedly agree, and and I I advise um, the police force in Derbyshire, and particularly the forensic guys there. And there is a worry, increasing worry, that what's actually happening is that used electric vehicle batteries are being exported and then imported as new. And also, um, there is an increasing criminal uh, activity in terms of sec uh, basically 
stealing electric vehicles and taking the batteries out and reselling those. And so that's not just what happens to the batteries, but also if the police then raid what's called a chop shop. My education has been in some very interesting areas over the last couple of years. If they raid a chop shop where they're chopping up these electric vehicles and they find batteries, what state are these batteries in? Are they safe? Are they unsafe? You know, so that, and, and forensic police officers, when if there's a, a, a crashed electric vehicle, they have to, if, and there's an injury or a fatality, they have to check the whole of that vehicle. Well, if, if it's an electric vehicle, then there's the worry about the, the, the battery pack potentially going into thermal runaway. So you're going to have to have a perimeter. You're going to have to have an exclusion zone around it for a start and perhaps not just have one guy working on it, one officer working on it, but have two for safety's sake. And that is a huge impact in terms of cost. We probably have time for a couple of a couple more questions. Um, someone's just asking, given the importance of what you've been talking about, how do we uh, or how is the information disseminated to the widest possible audience? Do you think? That's why I believe there should be a government-led campaign. In uh, information, I mean, if we can stop people throwing lithium-ion batteries into dustbins or into just the ordinary dry recycling waste, then we can save an awful lot of money because of the fires these are causing in recycling facilities and also potentially avoid deaths and injuries, which happily haven't happened yet in this country, but have in America. And at the moment, we're just looking at small batteries, mobile phone batteries, piece, laptop batteries. Wait until electric vehicle batteries come down the pike for recycling. Yes. Um. Yeah, if I could almost finally add that this almost is a perfectly worked example that that we are driving towards climate, you know, tackling climate change, and we shouldn't get blinded by the fact that every decision has a consequence, and that sweeping issues like this under the carpet is not the way forward. We need to have a we need to be forward on a proper understanding of risk all these issues and that I think Paul's presentation makes it really clear that a simple message that moving to electric cars is a panacea to all of our problems we need to think about other things as well okay, okay are we done with questions Kay I think um, we are yes yes um, in that case thank you again I'm going to hand over to Chris Calvert who's going to thank you formally if he's here, I can't see his name, from the Lytton Phil. Chris, are you, are you out there? <laughs> In that case, I am going to thank you formally. I think, I think the talk was sobering. I also think that if we have anything about us, we might try to get behind you with a government campaign on, um, because, Talking in schools is fine and raising awareness is fine, but quite frankly, um, there is some urgency with this. And um, I just, I wonder, Rob, if Northumberland that's benefiting so much from, from the batteries might not work perhaps with the university and um, advertise that it and fill on its way to, to, to make some pressure on, yeah. on through Bayes, and um, and Marie Trevelyan and, and 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 whoever. So, if there is anything that we can do to help that, Paul, we would be absolutely. I'm sure. And, and some people are sticking their thumbs up. I'm not the only one who's saying that this is a it, this this would be a good idea. I can't thank you enough. I'm sorry, everybody, that the IT has been dodgy. It seems odd, doesn't it, that when we're creating these fantastic batteries and doing all of these wonderful things, we couldn't get Paul connected to, to the Zoom tonight. But we got there. Um, one last thing, we're hard up. We rely on membership fees. Do join the Lytton Phil. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.